Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Catholic Culture Podcast. Uh, we've often discussed one great French 20th century Thomas philosopher on this show, uh, namely Jacques Maritain. We recently had a two-part discussion of his famous book, Art and Scholasticism. Uh, but one of his peers, who's also quite well known, is Etienne Gilson, a, a name that hasn't come up as much on this podcast, but we're going to be introducing him today. I'm mostly familiar with his writings on art, uh, as is often my entry point into reading philosophy. Um, but recently, Catholic University of America Press published a new translation of his work, The Metamorphoses of the City of God, translated by James Colbert or Colbert. I'm not actually sure how it's pronounced. Um, but uh, this is uh, Gilson working uh, both as a philosopher and as a historian of philosophy, which he was. And it, it, in it, he traces the search of Western philosophers for uh, a universal human society. Uh, and so I'm happy to have with me today to discuss this book, uh, Dr. Peter Redpath, who is, uh, well, most relevantly for our purposes, he's the co-founder of the uh, American Gilson Society and of the International Etienne Gilson Society. He's also rector of the Adler Aquinas Institute, CEO of the Aquinas School of Leadership, and uh, chair of the Thomistic Studies Graduate Concentration in Christian Wisdom at Holy Apostles College and Seminary, um, and the author of many books and articles. Peter, welcome to the show. Oh, well, I'm uh, very pleased to be here. Thank you for inviting me. So as I said, Gilson really hasn't been given a proper introduction on this series yet. So I was wondering if, if before we get into this specific book we'll be discussing, if you wouldn't mind just giving uh, an overview of his significance as both a philosopher and a historian of philosophy in the 20th century. Uh, well, Gilson is generally considered to be the leading uh, Thomistic uh, philosopher of the 20th century. Um, he was, uh, uh, as, as well as uh, the, the leading historian of medieval philosophy, um, at, at least as good as uh, Father Coppelson. And, uh, he, uh, Gilson was the founder of the Pontifical Institute of Medieval Studies at the uh, University of Toronto uh, in 1929, which uh, really started a revival of interest in medieval studies in general. Um, and uh, one of the reasons he did that was because he was interested in the study of, uh, of St. Thomas, but he recognized that um, an adequate study of him really required uh, people to be trained in, um, in different uh, skills uh, like paleography and, uh, and Latin and Greek and so forth and the, the, mm. the history of the Middle Ages uh, up, up to uh, and including the, the beginning of the universities. And so uh, uh, he's. Uh, he, I think he wrote. He, he wrote. Uh, uh, I think the number is somewhere around 177 books attributed to him or edited by him, and as well as uh, hundreds, uh, I think thousands of uh, of uh, book reviews and articles uh, in uh, academic journals and newspapers, hmm. different sorts. Today we're discussing um, the metamorphoses of the city of God, and I mm -hmm. guess in this, it's not that he's not writing as a philosopher as at all, but he he does largely have his historian hat on, right. uh, I would say. Um, and uh, so, so the basic concept is the he's he wrote this around the time that the EU was beginning to emerge, as I understand, uh, and. <sighs> He's tracing this idea of a universal human society um, from its kind of really all the way back to its uh, roots in Judaism and the kind of like the, the precursor ideas to that in Judaism. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, but really uh, taking full philosophical form in Augustine's work, The City of God. Mm -hmm. And he kind of looks at all of the the, the subsequent attempts to uh, conceptualize a universal human society as kind of uh, increasing degradations of the idea that Augustine had laid out, mm -hmm. uh, where it becomes increasingly sort of rationalized. The basis of the universal society becomes less of faith and more based on uh, natural law, maybe with some Christian trappings, but eventually a full 
fully uh, realized secular mm -hmm. uh, or even in, in, in its final version that he studies uh, uh, positivist mm -hmm. um, uh, conception of a universal human society. And it, it's very relevant today, I think, because this is still something that we hear um, even uh, high church leaders speaking about. And, and you sometimes wonder um, to what extent is what they're describing actually kind of the the more Masonic idea of the brotherhood of man that's been condemned by the church in the past. So to, mm -hmm. to what extent are they kind of owning the reality that there's only one basis on which universal peace and, and brotherhood can exist. Um, and so uh, I, I found it very timely to read mm -hmm. this and very interesting to see how even so many uh, well-meaning uh, and great Christian thinkers, you, you know, early on in the book, he talks about Dante, he talks about mm -hmm. Roger Bacon, um, are kind of gradually going astray in certain ways in their over-reliance on natural reason, for example. Um, so do, do you have any kind of general comments to make about this work before we get into the, the details? Oh, well, um, it's, it's good to contextualize it, as you said, within his background. Uh, he gave the, the work as a a Cardinal Mercier uh, in, uh, inaugural course uh, uh, at uh, the Louvain uh, in 1952. Uh, and um, he was, uh, he like, like Maritime, was involved after World War II with the uh, founding of the United Nations. Uh, UNESCO. He's a fresh. Fr he was a representative from France uh, to to UNESCO. Uh, there was a Congress on a United Europe at the Hague in 1948, uh, where the the modern concept of a European Union is is started to uh, become born. Uh, but there were uh, there were remote. Uh, um, remote considerations of forming such a union that went back at least till the 16th century. Uh, and maybe even the, the 15th century uh, uh, with, um, uh, uh, yeah, I would say at least, you know, some, some scholars in the, uh, in the, in the 15th century, just the, the concept of Europe he, <laughs> itself and how it originated, you know, as, uh, as, as, uh, it doesn't. It doesn't really re originate, according to Gilson, until the 17th century, uh, when when treaties and when when politicians start and and uh, the theologians are starting to reflect upon how you might form treaties to to get all of the different states that psychologically had considered them to be Europe, and, uh, and in as much as they uh, they were uh, part of uh, um, the. Uh, uh, the church culture uh, that uh, had been been established, Christendom. Right. So, Gilson's reflecting on the notion of what is, what is Christendom? What is the what is the church? How are the two related? Uh, you know, how, how how do we get the idea? You know, of Christendom, for example, and how did the how, how did the political institution get uh, get the, hooked up? Uh, uh, with the the with the city of man get hooked up with the city of God, uh, and so he uh, historically he, he to, to unravel all of these these issues um, uh, because he recognized that we're in a, a new period of time. Okay, but he he calls it the the uh, the beginnings of the the birth you know, of uh, of a new international uh, order. Um, and uh, to understand uh, where we are, uh, we have to understand how we got here. Uh, in in saying that, or in thinking about that, uh, Gilson's approaching this this problem both as a historian and as a a philosopher who is trained um, in the a classical understanding of philosophy, going back to uh, Socrates, Plato. Uh, our, and, and Aristotle and Plotinus, uh, even, uh, where uh, philosophy is not a study of abstract essences. Uh, uh, it's it's not it's not a logical system, uh, but uh, it's a reflection on real organizationals, 
real organizations and their behavior and how one develops from another. Uh, uh, and uh, those two, those two genera are confused historically. Um, uh, St. Thomas Aquinas in his uh, commentary on the metaphysics of Aristotle, um, book five, uh, lesson 22, talks about four senses of a genus. Okay. Most domestic scholars are not even aware of this, uh, that he talks about this. Uh, uh, one is uh, the notion of a race, it's historical sen- descent from a race. Uh, uh, a, a fourth one is the logician's understanding of a genus as, as a type of a, uh, of a, um, a, a abstract definition right, of uh, of some uh, c- common uh, definition uh, that uh, is a, a set of a multitude of species, right? And then there, there, are, there are two others. One which has to do with uh, a generating principle or cause that exists in a multitude uh, that is transmitted to the different species. That is the form, the notion of a form, and then that to which it is transmitted. Yeah? The fact that the one I just mentioned is like the idea of the a medical doctor, for example, he's a physician, and he and he's he belongs to the genus of medicine in as much as he heals people, but there's something that has to be healed. <laughs> you know, some some organizational whole material. So you have the that kind of a genus. And those are the ones that, that Gilson is working with, plus the historic that historical one, not understood in terms of a race, but understood in the sense that uh, philosophy is a historical enterprise. And not only is it an, an, an individual activity, and and Gilson doesn't arrive at this early on. Uh, he does to some extent. Okay, uh, in 1937, in one of his works, he says that uh, we sense with our intellect, and we intellectualize with our senses. Okay. Uh, and he understands human rationality. Uh, to be distinctive to a kind of animal rationality, not a uh, not a necessarily a political uh, concept or uh, or a logical concept, huh? and he says that uh, um, the um, that philosophy uh, is chiefly a, a psychological habit. He starts to realize this. Father Maurer, one of his great students, who was uh, I had studied with a, a great deal, not at the University of Toronto, but just because I knew him personally, um, uh, he, put, he 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 uh, maintained uh, for the first time in, uh, in in the 20th century that that uh, that uh, Saint Thomas chiefly considered to philosophy to be a psychological habit, uh, which uh, which uh, Thomistic scholars implicitly understand because philosophy and science were identical with St. Thomas. Right. And this means psychological in the, in the classical sense of that word, the yeah. psyche meaning the soul. Yeah. The soul faculties of the soul. Right. That, right. You can't, you can't remove faculties of the soul from the human person and expect mm-hmm. to be able to form any kind of scientific understanding. So how do you relate this, this uh, inclusion of, um, kind of the philosophy as something that's taking place in the soul um, and, and all of all of what you've just said, how do you relate that to this particular book that we're discussing? How, how does that how does that func- uh, function in in the discussion of the the universal human society? Okay. One of the things I, I always start doing when I start to write an article or uh, talk about something is go back to sp- an understanding of principles. Many people who are Study St. Thomas, they think that principles are logical premises, for example, right? uh, which they're not. Right? Uh, logical premises are principles, but not all principles are logical premises. That's mm. you know, one, of the, one of the understandings. Uh, and uh, Aristotle says that small mistakes in the beginning, meaning small mistakes in your principles, lead to large mistakes in, in the investigation. And in a science, St. Thomas maintains the whole of the science is contained in its principles, and its principles are contained within its definitions. Yeah. Now, St. Augustine starts this work on the city of God by defining a people. Right. Yeah. 
And if you don't understand, if the definition is wrong, if it's imprecise, down the road, you're going to have all sorts of problems, okay? Gilson doesn't, doesn't analyze that critically enough. Um, hmm. And this is uh, this is one of the weaknesses uh, of his uh, of his work. But nonetheless, he um, uh, he um, he makes note of the importance you know, of the uh, of these definitions right at the beginning. Right. He says that uh, of, of his metamorphosis to become one people constituting a city, a society must become a collection of human beings sharing in one and the same good. Okay. Uh, and he calls it also a multitude. I think this is the way he actually, actually defines it. Um, he defines it that way later on in his text. Right at the beginning, I think he says, it's a multitude of rational beings joined together by a common agreement on the objects of their love. You know, he's quoting St. Augustine. Jilson, you know, in the in this first the second chapter establishes Augustine's conception of the city of God. He then traces these de-evolutions of it to uh to kind of like a, a secular uh universal human society. Augustine is looking at the question of whether there can be a city or uh a society or a people without true justice. And and the problem is that if not, then you can't talk of the city of God and the city of man. There's only one city because there's only one city that has true justice. So instead, he decides to define a people by their unity and what they love. Now, if you get involved in the wrong gene, this is the problem, okay, that Augustine is dealing with. There's no way in which you can create the city of God on earth, okay? If you try to do that, you're going to create a mess, as Gilson says towards the end of the end of his book, right? But it's not enough even to talk about the city of God. You have to have the same understanding of God, right? Right? Uh, you know, in order to create what you're talking about with respect to a city of God. There. You now, so if you decided you wanted to do this and you wanted to create in the, the 20th century, 21st century, you want to have a new world order, you know, a universal, a universal, uh, international, uh, global uh, society, right? That's going to generate. Uh, generate peace. Mm -hmm. right? You're never going to be able to do that by trying by using the city of God as your model, because that's not a political city. You're better off going back to common sense. Okay, people in the 21st century, we've lost our common sense. Okay, right? uh, our common sense. What is common sense? Well, it's our common understanding. The common understanding of people who are familiar with an organization and the way it operates. Mm -hmm. Right, uh, and they focus their attention on that and. They have moral principles that they use, right. okay, that uh, that help them to understand uh, with the way they should be behaving in this or that situation, so that they don't lose their professional skill. Right? That the church will teach you about, right, and transmit those principles of natural law. Those principles of natural law are simply principles of prudence. Saint Thomas says that in his, in his treatise on law, uh, re related to. Uh, uh, the, um, uh, the the nature of natural law being uh, uh, different from instinct in animals uh, uh, because it's providence and providencia prudence is simply the contraction of the term providence because it admits of multiple different applications right yeah yeah you know, so so what so so the you know the prudence that uh, you know a politician has to have is unique to the talents and skills you know, of a, uh, of a politician. Uh, uh, and uh, you, you analogously uh, through, uh, through reading, uh, through, uh, through conversing with people who have got skills in metaphysics and, and in ethics, uh, the politician can become much better at being a politician. Just a quick break to tell you about CatholicCulture.org's fall fundraising campaign. As you probably know, the Catholic Culture Podcast is a production of CatholicCulture.org, as are the other three podcasts that I produce, Way of the Fathers with Mike Aquilina, Criteria, the Catholic Film Podcast, and Catholic Culture Audiobooks. 
Catholic Culture is a non-commercial, not-for-profit organization which is completely dependent on user support, and that's allowed us to operate entirely independently of any number of external agendas or commercial interests. And for that reason, I am blessed with amazing freedom in choosing the subject matter of my podcast, not just on this show, but on the others. If you think about a podcast like Catholic Culture Audiobooks, people love that series, but audiobooks of ancient 3rd and 4th century uh, Christian writings are not really a commercial proposition. Likewise, with this show, Catholic Culture's donors enable me to cover a more in-depth kind of topics than would be possible if I had to run on advertisements, for instance. Now, maybe you've been meaning to donate to the podcast, but you haven't gotten around to doing it yet. Well, now would be a great time because during this fall campaign, your gift will be matched. Some very generous donors have gotten together and offered us a $105,000 challenge grant. If our readers and listeners can help us reach that amount, they will be doubling it. And that will ensure that catholicculture.org as a whole, including these podcasts, will be able to continue throughout 2022. And if you're curious about where that money will be going in this fall campaign, other than what I already said, helping these podcasts keep going specifically, this year's campaign is really focused on helping Catholic culture to hire the technical staff we need to maintain our independence. Because the website being as old as it is, about 25 years old in one form or another, uh, got our start before out-of-the-box web management was available. So as a result of that, we run entirely on our own hand-coded in-house system, which protects us against the kinds of ideological restrictions and attempts at censorship that are now quite commonplace on other platforms. So the easiest way for you to support our work is to become a sustaining member. Many who do that just start out at $5 a month. It's very quick and easy to set up, and if you'd like your donation to go specifically to our podcast network, you can go to catholicculture.org slash donate slash audio. Any donation is appreciated, and we pray for our benefactors daily. Now back to the show. I think we've been we've been pretty meta so far. I think from, from here on out, we should probably uh, try to give the audience an idea of... Uh, some of the ideas, some of the specifics explored in this book. So Augustine, um, uh, he, he, regardless of what, how we might criticize it, Augustine defines a, a city or a society or a people, not in reference to justice, but in, in, in reference to unity and what they love. Um, mm -hmm. And thus, thus he can call the city of man uh, or the earthly city, he can call it a true city nonetheless, despite the fact not, not being based on something good necessarily. So he talks about kind of the, the roots of the hum the unity of the human race. Um, you know, he says the, the human race could have been descended from multiple men, but in, in order to assure the hu unity of the human race, we're descended from one man. We could have, a philosopher could have, could have determined, oh, we all have the same shared nature. But Revelation gives us more than this by telling us something that philosophy couldn't have told us, which is that we are all descended from the same individual. So we, we not only have uh, uh, a shared nature, but we have familial feeling, which uh, Jilson points out uh, really interestingly is, is a reality of nature. It's, it's a natural truth, but it's, it's a natural reality about nature that's only known by faith, uh, our, our descent from a single mm -hmm. pair of human beings. Right. So Augustine envisions two different universal societies, the city of man. A lot of people confuse it uh, by thinking that there's the city of God, which is the spiritual city, and then the city of man, which is the temporal city. Uh, Augustine doesn't think of it this way. He sees, thinks of them as two absolutely uh, exclusive and opposed societies. And so uh, later on, they're, they're essentially the elect uh, and the re whether they're currently members of the church or not, uh, and the reprobate. But later writers mm -hmm. turn this into the complementary uh, spiritual and, and temporal powers. One other interesting point that Jolson makes in his discussion of uh, Augustine, which is this fact that there was never a previous aspiration to a universal human society, a, a voluntary universal society uh, uh, united by love uh, previously to to Christianity. Uh, the pagan state never enforced a single philosophy, um, but the church, of course, has to, to remain itself. So the, the, earth, the, the city of God, of course, has to maintain a single philosophy, but the pagan state didn't, 
didn't it allowed all sorts of sort of philosophical uh you know variety and and one could say chaos but uh, there's a great passage from Gilson I want to read here he says from the moment at which the earthly city aspires to the universality that is initially attributed to the city of God, it must in its turn promulgate a single dogma assigned to all humans a single and even very earthly good, the love of which will make them into a single people, a single city. Between the pagan state of antiquity and the pagan state of our days, there is the Catholic Church whose spiritual authority the contemporary state demands and usurps. Even in so far as it is atheist, the modern state is completely totalitarian in principle. Um, and I think that's a very interesting point to consider um, be, because it, it kind of goes a ways towards explaining the emergence of, of totalitarianism as a kind of uniquely modern phenomenon. Not that there wasn't tyranny before that, not that there wasn't any kind of enforcement of uniform opinion on any kind of matter, but the kind of the totalizing the the, the the idea that uh we need everybody to share the same philosophy um on kind of a overarching ideological level is a very modern uh thing mm -hmm. uh in terms of in terms of a secular in terms of a secular thing rather than a religious uh dogma mm -hmm. um and i think that we end up coming back to this uh this concept towards the end of the book when he he talks again about kind of the repeated failures of all of these projects of universal human societies, which are detached from religious faith. Yeah, yeah, the, yeah. The uh, the ancient Greeks, uh, you know, they their notion of the political realm is the city state. You know, it's uh, uh, it's much more. You have competing city states, you know, and it's not until it's not until really Alexander the Great, you know, starts to starts to come up with the notion of internationalizing uh, the uh, the Greek, uh, um, uh, the Aristotelian uh, 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 principles uh, to uh, 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 that you get a kind of international an international flavor. You know, they kind kind of the notion of the net, the nation starts uh, starts to develop, and uh, their the, the psychology starts to change. But the church starts out as international, and he. But in a sense, the, the, this was also true of the ancient the ancients. Uh, when Gilson uh, 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 at the beginning of his Metamorphosis uh, uh, talks about uh, the church is Rome, Rome is the church, you know, and. Making reference to uh, Hilaire Belloc, <laughs> uh, Europe. Europe is the yeah, faith. That's right. the Europe faith is Europe. Faith. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Europe, is, yeah. Europe is the faith. The faith is Europe. Uh, and um, the uh, and, and Gilson, you know, they, uh, disagrees. But uh, in a sense, at the time, uh, is uh, going back to the ancient Greeks, the world was the Mediterranean. Yeah. Uh, the uh, Anaximander creates a map. You know where he's got uh, uh, he's got uh, a couple of Libya, I think he's got, and uh, uh, four four divisions that constitute the world, right? And one of them one of them is Europe, but you don't have a concept of Europe psychologically, you know, as uh, all of these different uh, nations because they they really haven't come into existence, uh, but. But uh, Europe, in, in its inception, uh, the, uh, from, a, from the beginnings of a, a philosophical understanding, uh, arise from uh, the notion of, of something that is, uh, is religious, as you, you point out. Uh, uh, Joseph Pieper, his, Pieper's famous work you know, uh, that is mistranslated, uh, Leisure, the Basis of Culture, in German is Musa und Kult, uh, uh, leisure and religion. Right? And Pieper, Pieper in that article is talking about, or well, that work is talking about how religion is the basis of culture, strictly speaking, in the sense that metaphysical principles. The, the ancient Greek philosophical culture is, is inherited from the oracle at Delphi, when Socrates is justifying his, his, uh, his, his activity right? and, and in the Apology. He, he refers to him being a in, in being given this mission 
right. by the Oracle of Delphi, right? So in, in a sense, the ancient, the ancient Greek, even, you know, uh, even the ancient Roman have a kind of implicit understanding that they're engaged in a, uh, in a global project. And all of them have this understanding that it is providentially guided. Okay. Uh, the uh, Socrates engages in his second voyage uh, after reflecting on Anaximander uh, and, uh, is, you know, that mind is the cause of everything, right? And that, that there's an aim, a chief aim, right? That we're all, that has to, that, that is being pursued, but then doesn't, doesn't do it in individual circumstances. And Socrates says, so he said he has to get started in doing it in his own way. Maud Radler gets engaged in a, in a kind of second voyage when he gets into all sorts of trouble at Columbia University, right? And, uh, uh, he doesn't really understand what philosophy, philosophy is, and he's he's got to recognize that uh, there's a, a there's a there's a chief aim uh, that uh, is connected. And Adler starts to be a great promoter of religion. He's a pagan mm -hmm. at the time, but he recognized the crucial importance of of religion to give metaphysical principles uh, and moral principles that relate to the fact that human beings are in pursuit of a common good, a common, an, an object of interest, as Cicero says, a common good right, in the future. Right? So this notion of a common love, that, that, that's pre present everywhere. Okay? Now, what we love most right, uh, becomes the chief aim for the pursuit of happiness. Right? Uh, and uh, the... Uh, 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 the, the we, we might not be conscious of it, but subliminally, Gilson realizes that all of these uh, all of these political orders are somehow seeking over the centuries, right, uh, to become internationalized into some sort of a global uh, world order, uh, are being received uh, into uh, the, the, the present generation on a global scale. And as a result, you have all of the cultural institutions of the Enlightenment are breaking down. It, Gilson saw this. So did Maritime. Uh, going back to, so, so did uh, 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 Romano Guardini, uh, for example, right? uh, and, and Maritime you know, in the 20th century. And they they're trying to figure out well how do what, what do we how, how do we replace this? We somehow have to get back uh, to a cultural inheritance uh, that's transmitted from one generation to the next. And I think we have to stop. We have to go back to square one. We have to to re-examine the nation, uh, the, the notion of common sense, and uh, uh, because everybody in every culture thinks that he or she has it. You know, and uh, uh, from that, you could you could grow a global understanding of the nature of religion, right? uh, or metaphysical principles and moral principles that would issue in a a a, a kind of Catholic uh, religion. Um, the uh, all human beings have this understanding that, at least to the extent that they're they're following an an, an ordered pursuit, right? Of um, you know, it's like scientific or artistic, right? That the present is rationally related to the future, right? That you and I are both are both pursuing an aim or an end related to something that does not exist. Okay. okay. Now, how? Something that does not exist can be organizing my activity as an up as as an opposite, right? Because I belong I belong to this genus now, right? Where I'm pursuing that and it's defining me. Mm -hmm. uh, unless there is some being that is a providential being that connects me to that future. Yeah? The pagan Greek understands this in one way. Socrates understood it in one way, slightly different from Aristotle. But all of them, Aristotle, Socrates, St. Thomas Aquinas, all consider that to be a principle of right reason, uh, which is the principle of providence. Right? Uh, and uh, 
Uh, if you try to substitute anything for divine right reason, divine providence, right, uh, and 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 make that a political kind of a principle, right? Uh, you know, so that you're superimposing your your idea of the state, the secular state that you're considering to be a religious state, you know, of uh, uh, like uh, the uh, uh, August Comte or Saint Simon um, might have thought it to be. Uh, you're you're going to have problems. Gilson remarks about that there hasn't been a theology of Christendom. There was always a theology mm -hmm. of the church, but Right. Starting in the Middle Ages, you get people trying to to think about uh, sort of Christendom from a philosophical perspective. Mm -hmm. This desire for uh, global peace, um, and also cer certainly the glory of God, the glory of the church, the the triumph of the church over the nations. Um, you know, th they recognize early on in the figure of Roger Bacon. Um, he recognizes. That one world means one faith, and then we have this problem that it's not possible to make everyone become Catholic. So mm -hmm. Bacon sort of ends up transforming uh, the city of God into uh, a Christian republic that exists in this world, and uh, it uses natural reason and philosophy to convert those who can be converted, and it uses technology to to kill those who, <laughs> who won't convert. Very interesting guy, um, <laughs> Roger Bacon. <laughs> yeah. And and so we already get this movement towards natural reason and philosophy being the main means by which yeah. we convince people mm -hmm. of the truth of Christianity, um, which I think there's a great tendency um, to, to nowadays to talk about the natural law. And it's very understandable because it seems much more difficult and unrealistic to get people to accept, you know, the supernatural realities of the faith, to get people to accept Jesus Christ. And frankly, uh, if it's unfashionable to talk about the, to, to start talking to somebody about the natural law, it's even more unfashionable to start mm -hmm. talking to, uh, to to someone about Jesus Christ and you know sin and salvation and and things like that. I, I'm of the mindset that I think I think I think we we're learning, and I think Fulton Sheen uh, said something like this too about how the arguments have all been made uh, and they've sort of failed us in the uh, at this point. Um, and that we we basically have to preach Jesus Christ in a much more um, uh, straightforward manner. Um, but but of course, natural reason and philosophy they have their their place. Um, but Roger Bacon and Dante after him both to ha both seem to have a, a too great confidence in uh, the ability of natural reason to sort of uh, almost make the world Catholic without making it Catholic. Yeah, that they, they they think that they can persuade people by means of argument. Uh, <laughs> that's like uh, you know most philosophical mistakes start from badly framed uh, questions, you know, from reasoning. Okay, uh, no, uh, no, the mistakes start from bad induction, as uh, Francis Bacon recognized. Bacon just didn't understand what induction is. Uh, neither do contemporary logicians, for the most part. It's, it's seeing the part in the whole. Maritain, Maritain understood this, this notion of induction very well. Right? Um, all reasoning starts from understanding right? mm -hmm. and from self-understanding, which is you're basically you're understanding a situation. Who am I? Where am I precisely? In what type of organization? And where do I want to go from, from here? Now, the church, in a way, and Gilson doesn't, point, doesn't stress this enough, I think, in his metamorphosis. Uh, because you know he starts with Augustine, talks about the, you know the fall of Rome. Okay, now, uh, in a sense, Christendom begins with the fall of Rome, uh, because all of the institutions that had been uh, that had been uh, in the hands of the uh, of the emperor and so forth, they they start to be taken over by the church, you know? and the, the preservation of the uh, of European culture, civilization, goes to Ireland and England, the, 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 the copyists and so forth. You know, the, uh, what what the ancient culture was preserved by the Catholic Church. Right? Uh, and uh, from, the, uh, from around the, the year 400, 410, you know, uh, 
uh, in the West, right? You have people going going over to the Byzantine Empire, where where they 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 still have uh, uh, you know are able to maintain the, uh, the the Roman Roman Empire, but in the, but in the West, right? Uh, the, the 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 administrative the political activities are are taken over by the by the church, and this happens. Consider, for example, Poland. <laughs> after uh, which gets reconstituted in 1917, after it's it's disappeared off the map, right? And the church preserved it. Right? Mm, yeah. uh, the the, you know, the the Poland as a psychological, you know, a, a psychological habit, right? Was, right. Uh, uh, was very much due to the uh, to the church. Stanley Aki talks about the fact that he says. Uh, Science is born of Christianity. Science was born of Christianity. Now, that's kind of hubristic to say to say in two respects. One, uh, it misunderstands the nature of science. It's reductionistic. It thinks it's mathematical physics, which it's not. Right? Uh, and uh, but it's true uh, with respect to mo the modern mathematical physics grew out of the Catholic International University Research University, University of Paris right. and Bologna. And so forth. So Jack, Yaki's right on the money, and that's after the plague. So the so it's normal, <laughs> in a sense, for 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 uh, Europeans, um, and uh, from the, the 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 fourth century, say, uh, sorry, fifth century up to uh, up to the plague and beyond, right? Fifteenth up to the sixteenth century to identify. The church as a uh, as a spiritual psychological entity to seeking to pursue you know metaphysically and morally to teach the principles to get you to heaven, and and yet the bureaucrats, <laughs> the European bureaucrats, to uh, be unable to think about themselves as apart from the religious traditions, you know, that are being passed on from one generation to to the next generation. Uh, which are part of that scholastic enterprise, the humanistic enterprise. So Roger Bacon had come up with this idea of a Christian republic uh, in submission to Rome, uh, but converted by means of natural reason and philosophy. Uh, but not, but the the, the 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 Christian content of Christianity itself had not been reduced to natural and re reason and philosophy uh, by Bacon. Dante um, has uh, this idea of a of a universal monarchy. In his work, De Monarchia, uh, this universal Roman-led monarchy, which uh, Jilson says is the first modern expression of a single temporal society of all humankind, and it's, it's an exact temporal copy of the Church. So this is this is uh, the first time it's been like really temporalized this this sort of city of God uh, concept, and. Uh, one of the, the faults that uh, Jilson charges uh, Dante with is his assumption that natural reason by itself is sufficient to enable all of mankind to adopt the same philosophy. Mm -hmm. So he's hoping that this, this, the world will be unified through the adoption of Aristotelian philosophy, um, even if not all of them become uh, Christian. Um, and of course, that the, the the emperor himself will be will be subject to and and receive his authority from mm -hmm. the pope, uh, but not everybody in the empire will necessarily. But they'll all be in harmony because they're adopting Aristotelian philosophy, um, and this kind of goes mm -hmm. back a little bit to what you said about the genus, uh, including both. Uh, you know that the knower and the thing known. In other words, if you, uh, in the abstract, yes, it is possible that everybody could uh, adopt Aristotelian philosophy. Uh, but the fact is that you have to look at it in terms of fallen human nature and the, the likelihood of that ever happening. Um, mm -hmm. And so this is what Dante fails to do. He's very. You see a great naivete in, in almost all of the figures covered by Gilson in, in this book. And uh, so, so I, I love this passage from Gilson. He says, with the ingratitude toward faith that humans so often demonstrate, Dante's philosophy is based on what it owes to Christian revelation in order to justify its intention to do without Christian revelation in the future. We have the result before our eyes today. 
In the middle is the worst philosophical chaos that the world has ever known. To the right, there is the union of reasons under the unity of the church's faith. On the left, there is the submission of reasons to the force of a new empire whose official doctrine hardly resembles Aristotle's. And so he kind of, he kind of, uh, Gilson kind of points out that it's naive to think that uh, not only that everybody would adopt the same philosophy, mm -hmm. but even the triumph of Aristotelianism in the middle uh, medieval schools was somewhat illusory insofar as they weren't all reading the same Aristotle, that they, they, they were, there were many different interpretations of what the true Aristotelian doctrine were. And so it had, uh, you know, Dante looked at it on a little bit more with a little bit more specificity, he might've realized that, um, it, it's hard to, it's hard to imagine the whole world being, United uh, by means of natural reason uh, under this philosophy, and and as he as he says in the quote, um, it's not like it wasn't through the influence of the church and through supernatural faith that people were that so many uh, in Europe were able to agree on some level of Aristotelian philosophy in the first place. It's not like they came to it purely mm -hmm. by by natural reasoning, right? Yeah. No, they came through it through, through guilds. <laughs> Basically, <laughs> you know, the uh, right, yeah, the um, it was a social, and aside from the influence of the faith in mm -hmm. harmony with you know aspects of Aristotelian doctrine, uh, like you said, it's a, it is actually a social organization. This is yeah. this is a tradition that's passed down and enforced to some it's extent, it's a transgenerational uh, social organization, or um, Adler calls it an enterprise. Huh? Uh, a social, it's a social science psychological enterprise that's that's being educationally transmitted through institutions uh, that include, you know, the stained glass windows in the churches and the, you know, where you don't have Bibles to read and stories and uh, um, and in common understanding. One of the things I I I've, I've taught on the college university level for only fifty uh, uh, over over fifty three years. Um, and uh, one of the things that I found is students are never convinced by arguments uh, and uh, that they don't tend to learn anything in class. Uh, they, as my friend Frank Slade from St. Francis College used to say, they learn in the rat skull. Um, they learn when talking about, they learn by, and Adler understood, they learn by talking about ideas that they find interesting, right? <laughs> Uh, and 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 conversing with each other, talking with each other uh, about them. That's uh, you know. You, so it's not the it's not the reasoning, it's not the argument, it's the understanding. Okay? And people's minds are changed not by reasoning. Reasoning is is is, is a, an inferior way of, try, of of trying to. You're talking about sight in some more basic sense. Now I'm talking I'm talking about that people are convinced when they understand. They say, oh, I understand. Uh, that makes common sense to me. <laughs> Until you can get to the point where you have the meeting of minds where the person says, oh, I understand what you're talking about. Yeah, I agree with that. All right? So you have to call it a mutual understanding, a mutual mind, a mutual meeting of minds. I call it a meeting of psychologies because it's much more complicated than just one intellect agreeing with another intellect. Okay. Because uh, St. Thomas says that the, the, the beginning of education in the home uh, uh, begins with docilitas, uh, making students, making children teachable. Uh -huh. And they become teachable by incul inculcation through their conscience. Right. right. Uh, and, uh, and, and through prudence, uh, prudential correction uh, by, say, the father or the family. Right. Uh, so now conscience for St. Thomas is nothing other than the virtue of prudence. Right? In as much as depending upon its condition within the human soul uh, is, uh, is praising and blaming, uh, uh, torturing, you know, uh, uh, issuing punishments or rewards uh, for what a person uh, has done. Right? So. To the extent that people lose a sense of prudence, and to the extent that that's not transmitted from one generation to the next, uh, that's, and prudence is a species of common sense. The, Aquinas talks about it in that way, yeah? uh, and he locates it. He lo locates it in particular reason, cogitative reason. 
reasoning goes from understanding to understanding, understanding the initial premise, understanding the middle term, understanding the conclusion, understanding how they're all connected. And it starts, it starts with understanding. It sounds like that when you talk about the difference between reasoning and understanding is that understanding has to do with having been enabled to see something which may happen through any number of different ways that are not necessarily by reasoning. Uh, and so once you understand something, then you can reason your reason further about it. But it, And it may happen through discourse, but it's not mm. necessarily through reason. It's mm. that somebody is opened up and enabled to see right. Uh, which might happen, as you said, you talked about the inculcation of docility. It might might have to do with uh, um, some form of inspiration or something speaking mm -hmm. to the heart or simply uh, growing in virtue in some way rather mm -hmm. than being reasoned into something. Yeah, the, the, uh, there were great debates. Uh, Morris DeWolf, for example, in, in the 19th century about the nature of scholasticism as a universal philosophy of the Middle Ages, which it weren't, wasn't. It's, it's a humanistic tradition of education. Uh, it's, uh, uh, it's the, uh, it, it becomes institutionalized uh, in the medieval university, uh, but, but it, it involves a, a cooperative uh, co cooperative activity on the part of a multitude of scholars, like translators, you know, who are getting the works of Aristotle, Aristotle you know, in Spain and in Sicily, and uh, and they're helping people like uh, like Saint Thomas to you know, to 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 get his hands on the works to this to teach uh, this in in class, and and uh, when they all of these these people have a common understanding of uh, a person with common sense. Has, has a common understanding of the principles that or the causes okay, that are being used to, to unify and cause to come into existence some sort of organizational whole that behaves the way it does. Okay? Painters are great at doing this. You know, sculptors. Uh, uh, Michelangelo sees, oh, the piece of marble, oh, that's terrific. I can make a pieta out of that. <laughs> the immediate understanding. Now, when what these people were transmitting from one generation to the next uh, were centuries of common sense understanding, right? Which you no longer have to repeat because you have a common educational heritage. The Enlightenment destroyed that. You know, we started starting in the pre-Enlightenment with Descartes. Um, we've got the whole of truth before us. No science exists. Uh, you know, for the first time, we're going to do it. You know. Uh, and it's it's in that context that they're trying to figure out, well, how does the church relate to all this? The church is irrelevant. It, it sounds like uh, we're also talking about what Newman would have called personal influence uh, as a major factor in in growing and understanding. If, if somebody is going to accept a truth, uh, whether of natural philosophy or uh, of or, or to assent to faith, um, there, there's a personal component that can't be can't be neglected, and also it seems like uh, you know Dante is talking about sort of like people peacefully accepting uh, the truths of philosophy. But it, it seems like to me, especially in the, under the circumstances that you describe, where this tradition has been uh, so profoundly disrupted, that there is a, a a form of conversion that has to occur. Whether we're talking about religious conversion, strictly speaking, or uh, the conversion by which one is suddenly enabled in one's heart to mm -hmm. understand something, as, mm -hmm. as as we've been talking about, even some truth of natural philosophy, mm -hmm. some common sense um, yeah. reality. Yeah, Dante's talking about the unity of the possible intellect. Okay, so we're all sharing. We all share in this. It's kind of like a veroistic. We've got this a veroistic uh, uh, intellect, possible intellect for the entire human race. Uh, and 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 you can you can persuade people by by argument. Now that uh, eventually that they're gonna they're gonna buy into this. Now what what happens after Dante? What happens in the modern age is they com you're completely so that it's kind of like a universal soul that uh, Neoplatonic, like a world soul in which we're participating. Uh, that uh, we, we we share in this illumination uh, right. as, as individuals. Now, uh, the um, uh, Descartes gets rid of the human soul mm. now, now, and re replaces it with law. 
you get rid of the human soul, you get rid of human virtue, right? Not only that, you get you get rid of distributive justice because you don't have, you don't have individual talents to you know that you're rewarded for when you perform different kinds of goods. When I as I go through these chapters in Jill Sun, one thing I see happening is that okay, so so Bacon realizes it's hard to make people everybody accept uh, the faith. And so we have to use natural kind of the least, uh, you know, uh, elevated possible means to do so, which is natural reason. Okay. So Dante, mm-hmm. Dante is still optimistic about this. As, as things go on, we get the realization, okay, actually, we're not even going to be able to get everybody to accept the same philosophical truths. So now what do we do? We, we degrade the level of philosophy to uh, in comp, you know, in, in to positive science. So we're we're giving up and becoming disillusioned with the possibility, as we see so much uh, division, uh, religiously, philo- philosophically, in the world. Uh, and and it's like there's an unwillingness to simply accept kind of the um, the providential disposition of grace that enables people to accept the faith, and that we're not always going to be able to guarantee that people will accept it. Um, it, it's like there's an there's an effort to to bring about this universal state of affairs instead of sort of leaving it to God's uh, leaving it to God's grace while making uh, one's efforts in a, the limited way that one can. In other words, kind of like using the means that are connatural to the end, which is something that. That uh, maybe connatural isn't the, the right word, but the, the the means that are proportional. Let, let me say to the end, which is something that uh, Jilson talks about, um, is that that mm-hmm. people who want a universal human society as inspired by Christian unity, uh, without wanting unity in the Christian faith, they want the end without without desire uh, being able to accept the means. Um, so. You know, if you're going to accept the means proportion to the end, which is this personal influence, this uh, this evangelization, person by person, uh, and this kind of uh, personal moral development, and folk really focus on the person, or at least on like a relatively small scale community, you're going to get impatient, and and if you want to get right to the end where everybody is perfectly united. Or to, if you want to temporalize this spiritual reality that already exists in in some level of perfection, in a sense, of the city of God. Um, in other words, the church is already perfect as it is. Um, but it it does seem like there's sort of like a, a an impatience to hasten the end times without kind of without actually <laughs> ending the world to just sort of have this perfect unity on earth uh, without without realizing the uh, the the proper means to achieve th- that that ironically the 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 proper means to achieve that end require you're accepting that you won't achieve that end if that makes sense because you have to do it on a personal level you have to do it realizing the freedom of of human will and of divine predestination uh, yeah and it, 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 this is never going to be achieved by university professors right right uh, right the uh, or or by uh, yeah, uh, the uh, upper level administration of the Catholic Church, uh, cardinals and bishops, you know, who tend to be property managers. You know, they're, they're worried about whether or not they kind of get, keep keep the parish solvent. You know, these other uh, got a, got a host of problems that they ha- they 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 have to deal with. Uh, when Bacon comes on the scene, philosophy is more or less uh, 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 conflated with logic at the University of Paris. Yeah. So they, their, their natural inclination is to think we're going to persuade people by means of by means of argument, and the universities are passing their influence out into the culture. But the the influence in the culture is coming chiefly from the Franciscans uh, and the Dominicans, uh, and from uh, Abbot uh, Joachim of Flora. I don't know if you ever heard of Abbot John Joachim yeah. or uh, uh, yeah, or Fiore, right? Uh, and uh, you know this spiritual, uh, this 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 uh, spiritual elevation uh, on the part of small communities of of, of individuals uh, who um, uh, Maritain talks about them as like reading groups, you know, that uh, um, are are having a um, a, a major influence. So you transmit, uh, you know, some of these ideas that. There's an arrogance among uh, uh, among academics, uh, which I find absolutely astounding. Like they, 
they, they have some ideas that they give birth to in, you know, in universities that influence the culture. Uh, <clears throat> but they, but uh, you have more influence on the culture uh, that uh, tends to happen from investment bankers um, and, uh, and from uh, ph pharmaceutical companies, uh, you know, and military, uh, uh, in the military entities that are neglected. You know, and as if they they don't they don't exist like the Medici's. <laughs> They're not having a, an influence on what's uh, what's going on behind the scenes, and they have forgotten from this history. Um, but, uh, uh, so um, you know, I think that the the, the psychological um, the, the psychological transmission of that alters uh, uh, human behavior is based more, as you're talking about, and on, on the on these personal relations. If you, people don't like you, they're not going to tend to listen to you. Jilson portrays this progression where the attempts to kind of create a universal wor world order go further and further away from the person of Jesus Christ, uh, preaching Jesus Christ and him crucified. They and, and they go further and further away from the sort of the particularity of the faith. So the faith increasingly gets uh, sort of abstracted uh, in order to, to get everybody to accept the faith or to show that everybody has already accepted in some form, um, which is a very common, you know, tendency today, you know, in the past century as well, um, in sort of liberal sectors of, of Christianity. Um, uh, so, so he, he talks about Nicholas of Cusa, um, who has this ecumenical approach where he calls for all religions to admit that they're really one with Christianity already in their basic beliefs, but they're simply different mm -hmm. in their right. Um, and so as, as Jilson puts it, he, he advocates for the comprehension of the faith uniting where the difference of faith itself divides. So in other words, the, the, the faith as sort of an intellectual, uh, organization rather than sort of the particularity of the incarnation, you know, uh, the virginity of Mary, the authority of the Roman pontiff, things like that are kind of uh, almost, uh, uh, not that he intended this, but almost treated as, as though they were accidental to sort of the basic unity of the underlying principles. And so this, this keeps progressing uh, and you get to Leibniz uh, who tries to, who's really, uh, he's a Protestant, he's really concerned with religious division, and he wants to reunify the church, but he does it by reducing Christianity to deism. And he looks at the Catholic church, or sort of the, the Christian churches in general, as the visible church. And the invisible church, again, is the one that accepts these underlying uh, beliefs, which are essentially de deistic. So there, there are these repeated efforts to get rid of the particularity of religion, sometimes with good intentions, simply because it, it poses a stumbling block. Uh, you know, Christ came not to bring peace, but a sword, as he said. Uh, it, it, the particularity of the Catholic faith is a stumbling block to unity, um, as much as it can be a sign of unity for those who are able to accept it. And then we get, as I mentioned, Compte, who is advocating the reign of science and this new religion of positivism, whose great being is uh, is humanity. Um, so uh, it's really interesting, and and again, so so totally relevant today. Um, and 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 you almost see all of these different levels of watering down the specificity specificity of the faith at work in different sectors of the Catholic Church, mm -hmm. whether it is, right. you know, the nearly apostate, uh, you know, far left, uh, or, you know, the kind of like, somewhat rationalistic uh, tendencies among some conservatives, where they're so focused on arguing the, the natural law, that they forget the kind of uh, the irreducibility of the mysteries of the faith. Um, that need to be proposed, even though they are potential stumbling bo blocks, things like that. So I, it's just very interesting to see this, um, to see that how this was, um, this these problems developed in philosophy, and 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 it's equally instructive to see that they often, so often, came from good intentions. As as uh, Gilson says, uh, we uh, we think the way we can, not the way we wish. Uh, and um, uh, this is not only the case with respect to thinking, it's, we, it's also the case with respect to understanding and reasoning and choosing. Uh, 
right? And we always do we do all all of those from uh, the uh, what we understand to be our situation, uh, what we understand the genus uh, from which we are reasoning uh, uh, chiefly. Uh, chiefly to be now uh, the the Europeans are are reasoning from their understanding of the church as identical with Christendom, right? right? And right. they they want to universalize that you know to people that they recognize are not Christians. So what they do is they water down their teaching, you know, uh, to claim that the, you know to to uh, uh, this is this is what religion is uh, and. Um, uh, that's the uh, that's the wrong approach to take because uh, what you'll eventually do is just pass on to future generations lack of understanding of their own traditions and their own c- 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 culture, their own heritage. I think Gilson winds up showing that. It's one of the reasons why I really enjoy this this work on the metamorphosis because it shows you you know that the, what happens when you try to when you try to water down religion and 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 your traditions. Uh, to get rid of the, the the unity of truth. But on the other hand, Gilson points out at the end of the book uh, that um, you know he's not. So what he's not saying that is that we need to you know leave religion out of it and so c- try to construct a universal society, a, u- a universal human society on mm-hmm. terms of natural law or proper metaphysics. Uh, you know those things may serve to unite a particular society that isn't Christian. As they mm-hmm. did, you know, the Greeks, the Romans, things like that. But, uh, but uh, what he says is that people need to either that they need to accept the means if they're going to accept the end. And and so, if you want uh, this universal human voluntary society, not a not an empire created by force, uh, that you know the ideal of which only came about after uh, the advent of Christianity, then you have to accept uh, submission to a common spiritual authority and a common doctrine, uh, a common faith. Mm-hmm. Um, and and if you're not willing to that to do that, then you have to, at least should give up the I, the aspiration to a universal human society and be content to try to create a yeah. just society uh, in the particular society that you're operating in. Uh, whether it be Christian or not, because it's simply not going to happen right. otherwise. Yeah, like you can't expect to create this through international law, <laughs> for example, like Maritime thought he could do, you know, and through the UN and so forth. Um, that's not going to happen. Uh, uh, Gilson recognized that, uh, that, 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 that there's something wrong uh, with this. So you mentioned the identification of Christianity with Christendom, and uh, before we close, I, there's a little, there's an interesting subtopic in this book that is worth touching on, which is this uh, attempt of Europe specifically uh, to identify itself in terms of universal principles, whether they are abstract ideas or Christian faith, which is also a universal, and so. He has this line. He says, "When Europe attempts to reflect on itself and formulate its own essence, it tends to be dissolved in a broader society than itself, for which it in fact recognizes no other limits than those of the globe." So uh, he goes on to say in a later passage, "We see a body that claims a soul too big for it, a soul made to dwell in another body, not only greater but of a different kind. When the body of Europe." It, is small, it will receive its soul, and those who come after us will know what it is after living it. It will be scholarly, but it will not be science. It will give birth in beauty, but it will not be art. It will be just, but it will not be the law. We hope it will be Christian, but it will not be Christendom. And we could apply this, you know, we're uh, we're in America, we could, we could apply this to the West. People talk a lot about the West. What is the West? And um, it's hard to define the West in terms that would not ultimately be Either global or desirable that they be global, uh, and and he he wants to, Europe to have a little bit more of a modest claim about his identity that it may be characterized by its adherence to uh, uh, Christianity or other things, um, but that it is not identified with the, those things such that Europe uh, wants to extend to the end, ends of the earth, which is still an issue that we see now as much as it was mm-hmm. in the times of uh, colonialism. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah, I, I addressed this issue in 1990, actually, and 
uh, Gilson wasn't around at the time, uh, but uh, one of the chapters that, that uh, uh, would he, I'm sure he would have uh, been in, involved in was a meeting, uh, the, the first meeting in uh, Europe after the Berlin Wall came down in 19, 1990. Uh, in Treviso, it was co-sponsored by the Conrad Adenauer Foundation and the International uh, Institute Jacques Maritain. Uh, I was the only representative invited from the United States to participate in this as vice president of the American Maritime Association. And the, the, the topic was uh, on tra the transition in each Eastern Europe uh, and uh, the, the, future of, uh, the future of the West, the future of Europe. Uh, and uh, I gave a I gave a paper at the time on what, what I called the new the new world disorder because uh, they uh, Europe was uh, they, they were euphoric. This was when Francis Fukuyama's uh, uh, book on the end of history and the last man were very popular, and there was this notion that secular society and with this Hegelian understanding of history. Had uh, finally won out of uh, capitalism, you know. Had won out over over communism, and uh, we were going to see this golden age of peace and prosperity, and, and concordism. And I knew from reading Gilson that preceding these you know, or, or immediately following these concordist periods in history, you generally have a period of genocide. <laughs> so. I, I went to this meeting and I was, I was young, maybe maybe around forty, and uh, I thought they'd be interested in seeing and hearing what a maritime would ha would have, would say uh, related to the, the future of Europe. Uh, and I told them that, uh, and Maritain had said this, and in, in his um, uh, talk about babylism and uh, in. Uh, uh, in politics in Europe and uh, different uh, political uh, writings he had related to the UN Declaration, uh, and he said that uh, uh, you have to have, and, and as part of his, his Declaration on Human Rights, which of which he was a major author uh, for the UN, uh, he said uh, you have to have a an, a new understanding of the human person. You know, is uh, a, a, a a humanism, a new humanism. Right? Uh, and, um, and it has to include this notion of the human soul. All of the problems that uh, that have been related to uh, uh, modern societies are related to misunderstandings of human nature. Right? Uh, and unless you, if you don't, if the uh, European uh, uh, societies have been attempting to replace virtue with law. Right? And have external principles of constraint on, you know, like mechanistic, like positivistic uh, understanding of, of the of the society, and you're going to influence people by propaganda. Uh, and, uh, and so they wanted us to give predictions. And so I, my prediction was that unless they change their understanding and reintroduce the notion of the soul uh, into uh, uh, into their their principles, the uh, um, what I predicted was new and more exotic forms of totalitarianism uh, that would uh, that would follow. Uh, one of the organizers from the Conrad Adenauer Foundation didn't like that very much, so he started screaming at me in German, uh, broken German and English, told me to shut up <laughs> and get off the stage. <laughs> they had heard enough. Yeah. But, but that's the solution. Yeah, you have to start with a common understanding of what people are, human beings are, and reach a common agreement about that. Right. Uh, and, and, and where you relate to that. Um, if you're going to make any progress, otherwise you're not, you're not in the same genus. Okay. Well, Peter, uh, thanks for having this conversation with me. It was nice talking to you, and I uh, appreciate your coming on. Thank you very much, Thomas. Nice, meet, nice meeting you. I hope I didn't bore you too much.